Welcome to Threads of Enlightenment. It is with honor that first I accept the invitation that the person has offered us. And I want to thank them for a couple of things that I know because in my life, I deemed it important and precious. First is their time. Time is a beautiful, expensive commodity. And I want to thank you, Brenda, for coming and sharing some of that with us this evening. The other is your journey. That houses personal information and insight and all of the rules and the uh, different wisdoms that you've gained from this. And so I want to thank you that you're coming and offering that information so that the hearer of all of things, we can learn together so that we can become better human spirits. Brenda, thank you for coming by Threads of Enlightenment. Thank you for having me. It is my pleasure. I'm so excited to hear your life journey. Uh, talk to us about the things that you have created so far, because I tell my people all the time, we are creators. The life that they live today is because they have created it. So. Tell us about your creations as far as some of the products that came out of that. And then we'll go and do, as we do here at Threads of Alignment, investigate that journey. Tell us about your creation. Thank you. Okay. Well, recently, the most recent thing I published is my book, Pathways, Walking Through Creation. And it's a poetry book, but it's different in that it um, involves poems about topics that aren't usually written. Um, so I have some of the more generic type poems, which still may be different from what you're used to. Um, but I also have poems about social issues, mm -hmm. about recognizing how I could change from understanding better how our, our, our world works how I needed to give up some previous perceptions or um, how I process those perceptions so that I could see things in a way to figure out what kind of a culture I would rather in than what we have. And so there's uh, so social issues about um, how we interact with each other, different people's views, what justice and equality, what truth really means. Mm -hmm. um, from what I've learned, these are my experiences and um, how my perceptions have changed. And I love also hearing about how others' perceptions. And I'm a good observer, pretty good <laughs> anyway. So um, the thing then was to realize that sometimes observations come my way so that I can delve into myself more and yeah. see if that's something I need to change more in myself also. I think that is why they do come. <laughs> but uh, um, talk to us about your childhood, Brenda, because I believe this is where our formative years of, uh, and those uh, insights from our parents, whether good or bad, that's usually the place that you and I began to form. And as I mentioned to you before, I believe you're all from a place of trauma. And usually a trauma basically is this a situation happened in the life, however it is. Sometimes it's something innocent, uh, sometimes it's not. But based on that incident, we as children interpret it differently. And based on our interpretation of that incident, we became traumatized by it. And as a result of those, that trauma or whatever, we then formulate our perception of life, how we relate to people, all of these things. Talk to us about your family life. How was it? Um, because we know that uh, our family, uh, they love us from their point of view, but sometimes things are not as it seems, but talk to us about your family life. I'd say that, yeah, I grew up in my, I believe that both my mother and my father loved me very much. I, I did have that perception of myself. I feel very lucky I had it that I was loved. 
but it was a very traumatic childhood, and I believe that affected me on various levels. Um, there was fighting between my parents. One of the poems is a um, is about that is about the thing that made my mother leave and um, the event, and it was physical. Um, my mother told me about it partly uh, once. And I didn't realize how bad it was until um, I was taking care of her. And eventually I had to put her for the last few months um, in a nursing home um, because I was getting sick taking care of her. But um, at one point, a, a device in the, in her mouth, part of her teeth fell out. And I realized that those were fake teeth that had been put in where my father was from. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I came up with a poem from the bits and pieces I had been told and my observations and what I uh, believe happened. Um, but it was a turning point in her life to go out on her own with three children mm -hmm. to take care of. Um, it was a turning point, I believe, in my heart life because of my reaction to it, because I was always weighing then the love for my father. It was hard yeah. to figure out where the weight or where the loyalty, mm -hmm. the love for my father and the love for my mother. This is a great thing to bring up with me. Every time I talk out loud about some of this stuff, I kind mm -hmm. of get a little bit more understanding. Yeah. So little, even more pieces come together. Um, and it's interesting because part of what I believe is important is for us to find that balance between the male and the female in our societies, in yeah. our national and world culture. And equality between those, having them both stand strong and equal. Mm -hmm. um, where, where do you want me to go with this? Um, no, yes. go wherever it, it takes you. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, I, I have had a lot of metaphysical experiences in my life. And mm -hmm. I, I believe that trauma um, causes hormonal changes and that that promotes metaphysical experiences. Um, a lot of those experiences led me to things where I paid more attention to how religions in our society that are dominant, how they work and how it affects the relationship of women in our culture um, to their children and the relationship between men and women. And I'm not talking about men versus women. I'm mm -hmm. talking about where, where they stand as far as um, equality is such a weird word, word now. I'm sure that when I say that word, people have, there may be a hundred different uh, ideas that, put, that go into people's minds when they say that word to themselves. So I'm talking about how we function as male and female together in our strengths and how we can become better at and equality between those sex, the sexes, but also the male and female in each of us. Yeah. Yes, I believe that that's very important. And these are the kinds of things I ponder and think about. Um, and I can see why ancient religions had both the male and female as powerful figures. And it is the original be, intent. Yeah, I do too. I agree. I, I think we have moved away from, uh, we have modernized and kind of corrupted, uh, most of the religions that are, uh, the core of it. It's the human, um, the, the woman is just as equal as the man. But yes. If we, if we think about it, um, again, my, my background is Christianity. If I'm coming from mine, because I've studied all, all the different types of religions out there, because I, I was just fascinated by, um, uh, different uh, perspective in the belief system. Um, from the Christian, um, the, the woman came from the rib of the man and in their teaching, 
And that mm-hmm. to me symbolizes equality because she's side by side with him. And um, I think if we understand where it, you know, that aspect of it, and this is where I think we, we, we falter because we don't know how to love ourselves. Now, uh, let me explain. Uh, I think we are, we're um, such a unique creature, each one of us. We are one of a kind. I tell people we are one of a kind. Uh, Brandon, if I am one of a kind and I have the revelation that I am unique and that I am one of a kind. And when I die, my everything about me, my eye, my retina, my, my fingerprints, all the voice record, everything that society uses certain um, uh, ways to, to identify me makes me unique and one of a kind. And so yes. then if I am looking at this woman or this individual that is next to me, they also are one of a kind. And so we have to speak and behave in a fashion of absolute respect and honor of each other because all of us are one of a kind. And I think when we come out of that space, we become animals because yes. we judge people. Yes. And you it, know. yes. And to, to respect that and to respect where each of us is on that scale. If, mm-hmm. If each of us also has both masculine and feminine in us, yes. as far as qualities, to as yes. our gifts to the world, individual gifts to the world, then that needs to be respected. That diversity needs to be respected. God doesn't make mistakes. <laughs> yeah, I think that society, um, you have society and the culture of society teaches a man that, uh, the modern day man, that he can't be in, in tune with his female side. And so when you have that teaching and that programming, the model that we are living in is a result of that, I think. Yes. Because, um, and if you get to meet a, an individual gentleman, a male of the species, that is a quote unquote, uh, sensitive person or, or is in tune with that, the other guys will, um, you know, belittle, belittle him or get at him. You're soft and all these type of stuff. So until we fix that societal problem, I think that's where it stems from. Uh, because when we tell, treat each other, um, from a judgmental space, you will never have peace. I mean, you can never, um, you know, you, I remember reading a book that says judging someone is a painful day for you. No, oh, that's, that's beautiful. In, in my early forties, I was in a major car accident and it took me out mm. of my career. Um, I, I seem to have had a life where in some ways I was always walking back into trauma. Mm. Um, and even in my jobs, because I could take on or was willing to take on the harder jobs. A lot of times that would be my assignment. And sometimes that took me into trauma because I would be dealing with people who um, were inclined to create those kinds of situations. So um, in the car accident, what, what took me out of my career was a diagnosed um, head injury. Um, I also had physical trauma. I went out mm. the window. Wow. It, yeah. Um, but that also, that also gave me the opportunity to reparent myself and to, um, recognize more of the ways, ways I, I had been personally inculturated and culturalized, whatever yeah. the best term is, because it caused me to have to step back and figure out my processes and strategies in life, to approach life, to function more in life. And that gave me, it was very difficult. It was yeah. not anything I would wish on anyone, hmm. but I can see the gifts that have come out of it to me. Yeah. Yeah. Because it did give me 
it wiped out some of the perspective that I automatically had had uh, processed through because that's how I was raised. Yeah. And it's not that it, the values weren't, it's that the values had been placed on things that weren't, um, yeah. yeah, things like um, certain kinds of success over what's best for people. Yeah. And I think both of my parents were caring people. They both helped other people in different ways, but both put value on that. So in one way, I was sustained by them. Mm -hmm. In another way, I was challenged by them to reorganize my thinking about how I looked at what culture is based on. Yeah. And that has been an area that I have continued. I'm in my 70s now. And I have continued to grow and understand in that area up to today. I am learning more and understanding more about colonization and settler culture and all of that. Um, and in loving my family, um, mm. that has offered me opportunities to move to where I am now. That also gives me more opportunities in seeing how, as we go through this hard time in our society, where fear continually wants to be the leader, how we can step back from that fear and make judgments about what actions we take. I certainly want a much better culture for my grandchildren and their children than yeah. what we have now. And that includes everybody's voices being heard. There used to be the say, saying that everybody has their own truth, and it was kind of a put-down saying because it mm -hmm. was like, well, everybody has their own truth, but this is the truth. Mm -hmm. And now come to everybody has their own truth because everybody has their life, and everybody has the things that, that they have to deal with in their own life. And if we're not listening to those truths, they are yeah. the truth. If yeah. we're not listening to those truths, we can't help make a better culture. So we do, in my perspective, we do need to be listening to each person's truth. And that's a way I think the indigenous people can help yeah. the larger culture because they already think that way. Yeah. They're already they, organized to. Yeah, they came out make, of a different system. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I my culture, I came out of uh, British Guiana in South America. And it's really fascinating culture. We were still a young, we got our independence in the 60s. But my grandmother and my great grandmother, as far as the slave, the time between slave and the free, was so close. And it was really fascinating to uh, talk with them because I, I enjoyed having the conversation with well, the, the older generation, which was just a few away from me, and they were, um, uh, it, it came out of slavery. And so it was really fascinating to um, have that conversation with how they perceived uh, the world from that. And that is one of the things that has always uh, been a fascination to me about how we behave once we become programmed and how uh, we allow, you see it today in society, where truth, um, I love the fact that you've mentioned, uh, Brenda, that every, everyone has their truth. It's once you discover those truths within your journey, the life changing truth is what we need to learn as we all go through our journey so that we can depend on each other for those that are coming through, maybe ahead. You may be ahead in that, uh, uh, journey. Uh, in a few other people that they can reach to you and um, partake of your wisdom and your strength from where you came from so that you can strengthen them and hold their hands and let them see the greatness that is within them. And I think our problem in society, I believe, is because we do not love ourselves. Because it says that uh, the great commandment is to love thy neighbor as you love yourself. So then if we take that premise, when we go from there, we can see that um, 
society because it says to love your God. So they don't have a relationship with their God because it is this God that is supposed to teach them how to love themselves as they learn having this, um, this close love relationship with their God. Based from that, then they will learn how to love me as they love themselves. And I believe we are lacking that crucial thing in society. As you said, we are not even giving each other the chance to speak. You have to be able to give someone the chance to speak because uh, um, they we are designed to. That's why we have mouth, you know. So I don't understand why someone would try to keep someone from speaking. It is how we are made. And there is such power within the conversation, which is sharing of energy, sharing of ideas, sharing of desires, sharing of shortcomings, sharing of weaknesses and strengths. All of this sharing, when you're done in a tribal situation, a smaller microcosm, it is different than it is when we are in this big petri dish of um, people that are propagating hate because it gives them what they need. Uh, we could see that in the politics, politician world, the politics, we see that in business world, we see that all over. And so it's a shame, but I agree with you. We need to give each other the space, uh, Brenda, so that they can express what's in their heart. Talk to me about this, this day of visitation, this accident that caused you to change your perspective of life because that would have placed you in a dark place. What were those thoughts that were running wild in your mind that could have kept you there had you allowed it? It was, um, <laughs> it was a struggle every day. At the beginning, after I was able to walk again, and after um, they gave me the okay to drive again, which... <laughs> When I look back, I wonder who did that because <laughs> there were lots of eye problems and my perception, even through my eyes, would be off as to what was a road and what a fence. Um, so I would, um, I would make a list. I would get to the grocery store. It wasn't very far away. Mm. By the time to the, I got to the grocery store, I couldn't list. So it would be, Automatic, I would buy toilet paper and, and, uh, tuna fish. Interesting. They both started with tea. I don't know why, <laughs> but, um, I had a closet full of <laughs> toilet paper and tuna <laughs> fish <laughs> because that was all I could read. And usually they, they weren't necessarily always on this, but anyway. <laughs> so it was, I think, um, there was, there could have been, it could have been much worse as far as the fear of reaching out. Mm -hmm. The good side of my brain injury was that I could only concentrate on one thing at a time. So mm -hmm. that means something very different from what somebody who's not brain injured would have to deal with. But what it meant for me was that um, if I got into anxiety, and I could focus on something else, the anxiety would go away. That hmm. doesn't mean I got anything done, though. And yeah. because I could function pretty well in some ways, uh, sometimes more was expected of me than what I could deliver because hmm. certain parts of my executive skills uh, um, just weren't there anymore. So, yeah. yeah. So, um Lucky for me, I could switch into my right brain sometimes. And um, that I think that was because the art side of me was encouraged by both my parents. So there mm -hmm. I was very lucky and fortunate. Um, I had to give up my career. Um, the, the children that I worked with were, um, I missed them very much. That was a loss. Everything was a loss, really. So I had to find a place inside of me where I knew how, who I was at my core, who mm -hmm. I could remember who I was from childhood or yeah. some part of me so that I could decide what direction I wanted to go. Because 
the therapists were very helpful, but some of them wanted me to go and become a person that I no longer recognized. Mm. That was no longer me. Yeah. I had to find my core to figure out where to go. And um, I think that's gotten better over time to be able to express myself in various ways with the poetry, with yeah, yeah. a different kind of art, because I can't do the kind of art I used to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how, um, when you, when because of the art um, background, and as you said, in, as a child, uh, when you were creating this new person, mm -hmm. um, what were some of those tools that you brought into your space to help you to create that person. You mentioned part of it was the art. I love the fact that the singularity of focus, I'm sure. Talk to us about that. You said that you used it to, um, to put the anxiety down. How did that quality of bring, focusing one thing at a time, how did that assist you in becoming who you are today? If I can, if I can back up a minute. Mm -hmm. Um, during the car accident, it was very unexpected. It, uh, my car went out of control in black ice. I, it, it, the weather was not like that when I started out. So the whole event was very unexpected. And when my car went out of control, I had been slowing down and, uh, I was in a very sturdy vehicle. I didn't expect anything that happened. That I expected to mess up the side of my car against the guardrail, and that was yeah. it. Uh, instead, my car flipped over the rail. Um, wow. I don't remember anything. I don't remember going over the guardrail. All the memory is that's gone. Yeah, yeah. But um, I do have a, remem a memory of a very perfect voice saying, "Be relaxed," and. Hmm. Um, I kind of carried that with me. I was a person who did a certain amount of prayer work before the accident. Mm -hmm. That was very helpful to me um, because I could still remember part of the prayers at least, and I could yeah. use a cheat sheet, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could use cheat sheets for everything. Um, so anything that would help me get into the relaxation, if I switched yeah. and moved and moved my concentration to that, to the paints in front of me and the canvas mm -hmm. in front of me, and just putting splotches. That was very freeing. It was a way to open, let go of any negative negative stuff that was going through my mind, and yeah. allow me to feel some joy in the colors, the shapes that came out of doing something without thinking about it. Most of my poems, I, um, they kind of come through my right. I'll say it that way because mm -hmm. I don't always know what I have when I'm putting stuff down. Then I have yeah. to go back and look at it and see if it has value, <laughs> see yeah. if I understand <laughs> it and if I want to rearrange a few things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I kind of, I guess part of what we're talking about is letting go of me controlling it. Um, yeah. Um, just plain wooden. Wow, that's a hard thing for a lot of people to to do, Brenda. It truly is uh, that letting go piece, and um, because they always feel as if they can do something, and the something that they really need to do is to let go, but most of them don't know how to do that, and they because of that, I believe they stay longer in in their situation than they need to be. So. Um, how did you arrive there? Because as I mentioned to you, a lot of people are there. And how did you get there and go, okay, and just uh, uh, release yourself? Um, how did you do that? How did I arrive there and let go? Yeah. Um, I guess when you're in a space where the world is entirely different than what you're used to, mm -hmm. and I've got to tell you, Ken, that I recognized in my friends who were still in the everyday world that yeah. the, sometimes the stresses of the world made them act like somebody who'd had a brain injury. Sometimes wow. the stress, it was a little temporary pieces 
but I think, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, do you realize that you're acting like me right now? <laughs> <laughs> you're so stressed, you're not thinking straight. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of a wake up call to both of us. Yeah. Yes. So the world right now is, is very lopsided and we all want to make things better for ourselves and the, our families and we'd like to see a healthier community. And I, I do think we need to take action. But for me, I would have to let go of, and I, I do practice hopefully, um, letting go right, right now. I'm trying to figure out how to let go of my belief that I have to buy things that are wrapped in plastic. How do I mm-hmm. let go of that and come to a way where I can get things without everything coming in plastic? And I think. What I need to do is be more self-sufficient and make what I need for myself instead of trying yeah, to buy help. so much from others. Yeah, so I think that would help. <laughs> <laughs> so we're we're talking about lifestyle changes, I think. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, that's another way of that's another way I think of me saying. I have to let go of how I've been living life. And I was forced to let go of some yeah. things because of the of major things because of the covenant. But it also helped me realize that I my needs, my real basic needs were different from my expectations of life. Yeah. Because of of the America so called American dream or Whatever you want to call it, I've been very fortunate. At the same time, I think letting go and not being in fear has made it so I could see potentials that would come along. So I, I could be outside of fear. So yeah. I could get back to the poetry. I, I could be outside of fear. So I could find a new way to do all. Yeah. Um, so did I it was the, the art. Again? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> was the art the and the poetry the singular pieces? Those pieces that assist you to um, to begin to change your your perspective uh, of life? Because I wanted to ask, how did you come? Um, let me let you answer that. Because then I wanted to ask you, how did you? Uh, what was the process? Uh, with the book and the stuff, how did that come about? But it was the art and the poetry, the tools that assist you into moving forward and uh, letting go of fear and all of these things? Yes, I, I believe that's so. And I'm looking at the top of my screen and seeing your title, Threads of Enlightenment. And <laughs> I say, as we... As we weave, I had to reweave the fabric of my life. I had yeah. to find things that gave me strength and, and figuring out who I was at my core again was one way. And I couldn't have gotten there. I don't think without the, um, art and the poetry and there's music. I'm, yeah. I've, Never been good at creating music. I love it. Um, I can hear the different parts of like orchestras and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and, but music sometimes came into me. I could feel the music before the words came sometimes in wow. poetry. There's some poems that have beats too. Yeah. So, and not like I am big pentameter beat, but. It's a similar type of thing, except I can tell you what it, it kind of came in on a wave of a feeling of music. So, um, I hope that answers your question some. Oh, it does. Yeah. I, 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 I I love, I love, um, big band music and (laughs) I'm passionate about big band music. And one of the reasons why I love big band music is 
because of the layer in the instrument, I'm a musician. So um, the big band, uh, those guys, um, they started uh, doing all the different layers and you have the different parts. And when I hear that music, because I hear the individual parts, um, there are lots of musicians today that I love listening to their music because it's so layered. It's rich with little uh, nuances that is powerful stuff. And so I, I get it when you talk about the arrival of the poetry in music, because as a musician, sometimes when I close my eyes, um, and I would play, um, uh, the, the notes would arrive to me. I will see the notes, um, and stuff like that. So I, I get. Uh, your explanation because I know personally it happens to me as well. So I, I, I got it. <laughs> yeah. It's a great feeling. And it's a great, yeah. it's a great feeling. It takes when that wave comes too. You can't say yeah. you feel any, any stress in your body. Yeah. So it's, that's like a gift too. That's, yeah, it, it, it is a gift. So I guess the allowing of the gifts, but I, I see a, my perspective, I'm not a teacher and I have no curriculum or anything. I'm just sharing experiences and awareness. But it seems to me that our global culture right now needs to have the threads rewoven. I do. I believe that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think we are, um, COVID came to expose much. I think it exposed a great deal. And because of that exposure, um, it has given, um, mankind a, an opportunity to re-evaluate their purposes on this planet because they're got a chance to get off of the wheel, if you will, from work. Many of them were, uh, forced to stay home. And I remember one of my friends, um, he's a multimillionaire and he said to me, uh, we had a conversation one day and he said, um, about money. He said, all money does is, is magnify the individual. If they were a prick when they were without money, they'll be a prick with money. And it's really a fascinating thing how, uh, this particular, um, opportunity that was given to us as mankind, we got a chance to get into the glimpse of many people's personality and we saw increase in violence. We saw people leaving work. We saw all kinds of things began to be exposed um, to a level where now people have the opportunity to reinvent their lives, give yes. birth to many things that were being, um, were, they were pregnant. Many of them were pregnant with books, were pregnant with, with businesses, many of them. And had this not happened, they would have aborted that pregnancy because they were so busy running around doing and chasing the american dream and yeah. so um i think we have to we have to reevaluate our life it's given an opportunity my hope is that uh, on a mass scale that uh, the fruit of this will create a new world that we want and so it's um i know it's changed much but i don't know what it's going to be like but um i am glad that we have someone like you that have tapped into yours have found your gift um, those that are listening to this conversation, on the onset, she told us about her creation. And you guys know how I feel about that. And I tell people, uh, uh, her book is Pathway, Walking Through Creation. That is such a beautiful title. I wish I had thought about it. But um, I want you guys to get her book. And, and you know how I feel. I've talked to people many times about this. When you are um, in front of the book of an author, that book houses their energy, their wisdom. And within those pages, as you read them, you're having an intimate conversation with the author. Anytime I pick up a book, I I have that in my mind, that I am having an intimate conversation, an exchange with this author. So, and, I, and I'm always there in a state of uh, um, awareness and acceptance and because I'm searching for something. She has been through much, and she has some stuff, guys. I want you to grab her book, grab it, get it to people, because that title alone, I think I'm I'm buying it just for the title alone. Halfway 
walking through creation. And she talks about it as a, as poetry, a collection of poetry. Poetry carries much power. They are concise and they are powerful. And I want you guys to get her books and become a student of her. Follow her, get to know who she is and learn more of her. Let's talk about how did this book came about in your life as you were going through all of these things, reinventing yourself, um, all of this stuff. How did the thought, that first thought or series of events cause you to say, wait a minute, let me put this in a book format? This isn't my first book. Mm -hmm. um, there were some, um, there was a couple of other books that um, are out of print now. I think part of it was me trying to put my life back together, trying to find yeah. ways after the head injury of making sense out of things and trying to find those threads that went through things. So uh, one of them was about my journey through the head injury. Um, another one was just some poems and um short essays or short uh, prose writings about family things. The the book that we're talking about today is 90 poems that I pulled out, poems I've written over my lifetime. I started as mm -hmm. a child. So one of the poems is from the 1950s from elementary school. Um, wow. Yeah. So I think part of it is weaving some of the old with the new. Mm -hmm. Leading ways that I used to be with my perspectives of life now. I'm, I'm not a teacher. I have no curriculum. <laughs> um, I'm just sharing how I went through things and how I ch I've changed and how I've stayed the same in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Because the foundation, that's the core part to me is mm -hmm. I still had to find the foundation on which to plant feet. Mm -hmm. And I was able to do that. And it doesn't mean I always feel it because we're all slipping and sliding right now, it seems yeah. to me, trying to find our footing in in the culture that we're in because it's all changing. And the people who... The thoughts and ideas that we thought had been laid to rest are coming out of the woodwork. So, yeah. yes, we're trying to figure out how to deal with this and keep sanity as the highest priority. So it's um, writing was a way to see my own. It was a need I had. But I found that in doing it, I could see connections that I hadn't realized even were there. Like when we started talking and you brought up my parents and I put that together with my need to get the feminine principle equal to the male principle in our world. Yeah. Yes. So isn't life is so interesting, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> it is a wonderful class we were in. <laughs> It is a great classroom, you're right. And we're all <laughs> students. And I think by sharing with each other, we can be helpful to each other. And I, I'm hoping that I'm giving voice to people who think the same way and are glad that I put it into words. I believe that's why you went through it. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> I think... Um, I have a strange belief about things like that. I believe um, everyone is supposed to go through their journey. I believe we are all independent. We are independent, but interdependent. And I believe the independent part of us, for us to go and embark on that journey, is first to fall in love with ourselves, find out who are you, who am I, and see the richness that is you. Learn to love you, learn to forgive you, learn to be not judgmental of yourself because the, what you are doing as you learning, uh, you're learning these things, you're going to be able to react and interact with me, a different human being 
because you've learned to love yourself, you can love me. It'll be richer, deeper, because you've learned to forgive yourself, you can forgive me. It, it is something you, you won't hold against me because you learn to forgive yourself and you understand. You understand the pain that not forgiving oneself causes. And so you don't want to do that. So you've learned to be empathetic. You've learned all of these beautiful qualities. And as you learn those, you then interact with me and we hold hands and we talk and we in, enjoy our space together. And that's how I believe. Uh, and that's why I made this statement. I believe that one of the main thing is that we, we haven't learned to love ourselves, but anyone that has learned and been through that journey to love themselves, they understand it. And I believe that uh, as you come out of this, you are a teacher. I believe you are a teacher because you have come out of it. And because there were people that a lot of the need was so great because there's so many that are in that space. God had to uh, find someone he can trust that will learn and spend the time and be patient with themselves to walk out of their journey. And so then you are now able to present it, uh, your journey in a format by which someone can have access to it. And I wish I said to you there are policies and procedures in, in a space of, of the, the, um, you know, self growth in, in enlightenment, we call it, or, or, and wisdom and all that. But from a businessman where I've been through his policies and procedures, because we use that to guide our lives now. Brandy, you are a teacher because you will be teaching people how to come out, how to survive, how to uh, um, become a success out of their story because you've been there. And that is the purpose of every one of us going through our journey is so that we can become servants. It is the highest place to be as an individual when you're relating to someone. You're holding the space of a servant. I, I one of the fascinating thing in my belief system that freaks me out to this day and they they teach me that jesus christ is god incarnate and here he is with these men and so we're having god watch it washing the feet of men to me that is a powerful picture of how we should be with one another i should hold that space is to be able to wash my uh, brother's feet my sister's feet so that we can be at peace with each other. But I believe you are able to be trusted and uh, with your journey in order for you to come out so that you can now become a servant. I believe we're all put in that place because God sees a need and he needs people to fill that need. Your servant comments, and I hope that my book is of service. It's, I don't think you can teach anybody anything unless they're it's where they want to go. Right. Um, yes. Yeah. And, um, but I, I liked what you were talking about to be of service. I hope my book is of service to people. I'm sure it will be. <laughs> and I'm sure it is. I want to thank you so much for coming by and, and sharing your precious journey with us. And then you have, I see a strong woman, someone that has reinvented herself to become this beauty this power, this joy. And I thank you so much for coming by and sharing all of you with us here at Threads of Enlightenment. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Thanks for the opportunity. It was great to talk. You're welcome. To you.